Hello, Defenders of Freedom. Welcome to November Drill, and thank you for listening to the 182nd Air Wing Podcast. But for those of you that don't know me or don't recognize my voice, my name is Colonel Rusty Ballard, the Wing Commander, and I'm honored to do this today and narrate this as we go forward. With this podcast, we're just trying to keep up with the times so we can communicate with everybody out in the wing the best that we can. It's not going to be perfect. We're going to learn as we go forward. Kind of what we see going forth is having different conversations as part of this podcast when you're coming to drill. Hopefully to keep you awake, not to put you to sleep. Uh, I'll start off the first one as we learn from this one and go forward. We'll now have the next one done by the vice wing commander, the command chief, or a group commander, or somebody on base. Uh, maybe an interview with them and just talking about some of the events. And it's only about 15 minutes just to connect with everybody on base. So just a highlight of what's going on on the wing, some of the culture, where it started, where it came from, and where you are as part of that. This podcast effort is in correlation with other events to bring people into the culture of the 182nd Airlift Wing. One of those efforts being the uh, Wing Heritage Display uh, in the Wing Headquarters building. If you haven't had the opportunity to make it Wing Headquarters, please do it this weekend. We had some people put in some time and effort to build a heritage display where people come in to the wing to get pictures, whatever they swear in, take the oath of office, and so forth. And it is broken up in three different areas where you talk about the history of the wing, you talk about important people that have been here in the wing, and some of the exercises that are happening at a given time. Significant events, so there's going to be four changes of command. You have Lieutenant Colonel Randy Fasig going from the OSS Squadron and Operations Group, and he's going to be taking over in maintenance as a squadron commander this month. His change of command, as long as um, Major Karras has taken over Combat Com Squadron, he's been there for many years. He is going to be replacing Colonel Bridget Zorn, which took over the Mission Support Group commander last month. You have Jason Hurt, which is going from Wing Plans, the XP, to become the Airlift Squander Commander in Ops. You have Justin Childers, Lieutenant Colonel, taking over as the OSS Squander Commander. Uh, a couple of promotions that I'm tracking right now. There's uh, obviously going to be more, but uh, Major Mini is going to be printing on for Lieutenant Colonel, his promotion. And then Master Sergeant Kenyatta Williams, the first shirt over in MSG, is going to be printing on Senior Master Sergeant. And then we have a lot of retirements coming up. The one notably I'm tracking right now is Chief McMullen over in Air Report. His retirement ceremony is going to be happening this weekend as well. The maintenance group, we started this not too long ago with spouse flights. So this is going to be their month for spouse flights to get in the C-130, fly around the local area, and tie our families more so into the base. Some of the training items, you have a safety stand-up, which is mandated by the Chief of Staff at Air Force, and that's ORM mandated. Uh, so operational risk management, basically educating people, hey, don't take risks you don't have to. The wing is 100% uh, responsible for their own readiness, and what they see it across the Air Force is people are doing pretty silly things, and it takes them out of the fight. So try to get ahead of that. We're going to continue our training with suicide prevention, and that is going to be due by the end of December, so we'll continue that training. Some of the physical health assessments are going to be unlocked by the medical group, and that's all in line for what we call PHA quick. Medical requirements are going to be done. We're going to do everybody on the base that we can in March. So for the last year and a half, the medical group has traveled to different wings across the Air National Guard to learn how other wings do it so we can move that up and become more ready to answer the call if needed. Other thing happening is flu shots. If you haven't got your flu shot, there's going to be plenty of time for you to get that over this drill weekend. Deox survey. So you've probably heard of that before, the Defense Organizational Climate Survey. Basically, every August now, there's going to be a survey in every military organization within the Department of Defense has to do a survey. It's going to close out at the end of November. Right now, we're at 33% of people that have taken that survey. I just ask that everybody take that survey if they possibly could. Good, the bad, ugly, I want to hear about it, right? And whenever you do put something in that survey, give me context on it. The people are doing good, the things we can work on it. Anytime you put something in there, the only I ask you is take ownership of where you stay in that. So if you've worked through an issue or if you're thinking about putting in something, how did I work through the issue before I put it in there? Because communication is really what we're trying to get at overall. If someone's doing something wrong, I want to know about it. Let's fix it uh, as an organization as a whole. And I want to know what we're doing well. But use that as a tool to communicate with us. That's why I'm getting paid to do this job, is to make this a better way. And we strive to do that every day. Uh, give me something I can work with. And I appreciate your input. All right, profession of arms. So big picture, what I'm looking for is 
people to be within regulations. We do too many good things to be distracted with people not following the reg regulation. And I'm talking about nails, I'm talking about hair, I'm talking about weight, I'm talking about PT tests, I'm talking about uniform wear, I'm talking about uh, unapproved patches. All right, these are very basic things that anytime somebody enlists in the military, they know it's part of the regulation to do that. And I recognize that our military base is a subsect of the civilian population, especially so on an Air National Guard base because the preponderance of our people are civilians. But we need to stay in check when we come on this base and do everything right. We do too many good things to let the little things distract us. And I've noticed a couple times, or I've heard stories of, like people see somebody that is out of regulation. And they try to do it in the nicest, most professional way, but somebody will take offense to it. And the first thing they do, they point their finger at somebody else and say that they're doing it wrong. That's not very professional. Own it, take accountability for it. People are just trying to help you get to where you need to be. We have a great culture, very accommodating culture. Keep up the good work and do those things. So if somebody says something, yep, Roger that, I'll check into it, I appreciate it. What double A makes this a little bit more difficult is some of these regulations over the last few years, uh, for a good reason, they've changed and they've opened it up to be more lax. However, some of the ways they've told the community about that, it's not through an AFI or regulation. Sometimes it's just through a Facebook message. So times, sometimes there's confusion of what the actual standard is. So it makes it hard for people to know what is right or wrong. So if you are asked or questioned about this, um, just try to get within regulations. And my leaders out there, supervisors, NCOs, commanders, follow through with it, hold that standard, and get everybody on the same page. Likely, people don't want to be out of standard. They just don't want any better. Let's get there, uh, own it, and uh, let's not have to talk about it again. So I appreciate that effort going forward. The Air Force, uh, due to current threats in the world, is changing our deployment construct. And you're going to hear a term called AF4Gen, Air Force Generation Model. The whole intent is to get it so individuals aren't going by themselves on deployments, and they want you to deploy as a wing. And I'm not going to get into all the granular detail about this, but I'm going to talk about it a little bit. So they want us to deploy as a wing. And one of the things they're going to call a wing, they're not going to formally change the name, but what the 182nd is going to be, like many other wings in the Air Force, is a combat generation wing. And the reason they do it in the Air National Guard is because whenever we deploy in the future, it's going to be two wings coming together, and they're going to create what's called a DCW, a deployable combat wing. And those two wings are going to marry up, and they're going to deploy, and they're going to go together. Leading up to the deployment, they're going to go and exercise and work together before they go in that deployment. So that's the big picture. Part of the af gen deployment construct is four phases, where you're available for 180 days as a wing to go deploy. When you get back, you have six months to reset, and that's in dwell. And then you're going to go into uh, the prepare and certify phase. And this is a four-year cycle. So, all right, so six months, six months, and then you prepare for two years before you go in the certification phase. During the prepare and certification phase is when we're going to do combat readiness exercises and inspections before you do the next deployment. So that's a four-year cycle, and it's going to take about five to six years to start this cycle. You have a lot of moving pieces and parts. You have the contingent response conversion here at the base, and we also have the C-130J conversion coming here on the base. CRG, that conversion starts in April of 25. Uh, for the C-130J, that's going to start in May of 26 when we get the first C-130Js here on the base. So a lot of moving parts, but I know this is coming out and I want to just talk to you about it a little bit. When you have a DCW, a deployable combat wing, when everybody leave here, they recognize that there still needs to have an at-base in garrison need to still run the base. You still have people that are going to be coming back from training, pipeline training. You're going to have uh, civil engineers still working on the base. So what they're going to have is what's called an ABU, an air base unit. And that's going to have a deliberate piece that's going to stay here at base and still run the base at a bare minimum until the entire wing would come back from deployment. With that, they've talked about groups going away. So no more group commanders. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be any O6s, uh, like a, a, an operations group commander, a maintenance group commander, and so forth. Those O6 positions will still be there. They're just going to have different titles, like a DCOM, Deputy Commander O for operations, S for sustainment, and then you'll have somebody running the air base unit. So a lot of changes coming. Big picture, continue to do your job, and you'll be perfectly fine. 
And we'll tell you as those things happen. But part of this aforge in process for this wing deploying, the biggest change that I see is called the A staff. So every staff in the military, whether it be the A staff, the S staff, J staff, or joint, uh, every wing is going to have that. And that's what they've determined. So what does the A staff look like? You have A1 through A9. So it's going to be personnel, intel, operation, maintenance. You're going to have comm, you're going to have command post, conversions, a little bit of everything. And what we're trying to do is build that now, a little bit earlier than the deployment, so we learn how to use it as a function on the base. Lieutenant Colonel Cindy Niles is going to be the chief of staff of that A staff. And we've put some names against that in this November drill. We're going to brief them the first time on what it means to be on an A staff. We don't have all the answers. We don't have all the training. The Air Force has not given that to us yet. So we're going to learn as we go. So as they go forward with this A staff, how I see us using it initially is for the exercise this coming September. During any exercise, we have what's called an EOC, Emergency Operations Cell, and that's led by the EOC director, which is currently uh, Lieutenant Colonel Bridget Zorn. So all those functions when the EOC staff, they're the ones that handle any kind of crisis on an everyday basis, during a drill, and during an exercise. So the A staff is gonna be that EOC, well ahead of time. So when they get to the exercise, they've already been working together and planning to get ready for the exercise. But as I talk about the exercise, which was formerly known as the REV, Readiness Exercise Evaluation, is now the CRI, the Combat Readiness Inspection. Uh, we just came out of the readiness exercise back in September. We learned a lot of things. We worked together, but that was all to lead into next September. That's when AMC, the MAGCOM Inspector General, is going to come look at us and help us out, and we're going to operate in a simulated contest environment. What we did was take some of the feedback from this past September and we put together a red and blue team. Uh, the red team being the IG and wing plans, they're going to say, okay, how are we going to do this exercise? How are we going to evaluate ourselves uh, and how are we going to plan it? And then we have a blue team, which is led by Lieutenant Colonel Randy Fazig and Bridget Zorn. And they're going to say, how do we have these touch points? How do we work on these war fighting skills? How do we work our part teams? How do we work on our communication plan? How are the UCCs going to operate in the exercise? And we're going to do a phased approach with touch points over the next year to do so. And we're going to audit that work and make sure to do it right. We're going to get people's airmen's manuals and we're going to be prepared and ready to go next September. Uh, a big change coming. Uh, as everybody knows, inflation has affected everybody. It's certainly affected the space. I'm talking about contract quarters. So before, we could pretty much give a hotel to everybody. We can't do that anymore. Uh, inflation has caused our, our contract quarter, quarters lodging costs to go up 11% over the last few years. Uh, we're one of the most expensive in the Air National Guard. We're the eighth most expensive in the Air National Guard, and we have to get that under control. I get a budget every year, and we're almost... 35% of that cost is just going to lodging. We can't continue to do that. I have to be a good steward uh, of that funding. So starting in November, Thursday night hotels will no longer be provided if you reside within 200 miles of the base. Unless you're an E1 to E4. They get paid the least amount and it's going to be the most challenging. So I'm going to provide them a hotel a little bit longer. And then the commuting distance overall, which used to be 50 miles, is now going to be 75 miles. So that's different, right? It's not entitlement. It was something we've been able to provide for many years. We're going to continue to provide that Friday and Saturday night. We're just going to have to limit the Thursday night and how many, how many people we provide that to. That's going to be a change to your habit pattern. Coming to drill, a lot of people would get here Thursday night, stay in the hotel, and now you're going to be asked to come in Thursday night and provide your own lodging or come in the next morning to be here for drill Friday morning. Uh, work with your commanders. Uh, what makes most sense to you? I don't want you getting up at two in the morning to drive here. So you are going to have to find someone to stay with or get a hotel or find some other accommodations. But we have to do that going forward. Other anticipated changes I see to make sure we meet that bottom line coming forward, and it could be as early as December, is changing to the buyout option. Some people don't want to have a roommate. And so they want to buy it out and then we pay money for that. We may not be able to provide that option for the buyout so we can get underneath the amount of money that we can spend on this program. Uh, some dual occupancy, we're going to still provide for that. So if you're a single parent with a child, we'll still provide lodging facility for you that if you're taking uh, advantage of the uh, daycare during drill weekend, some commanders, SELs, and those on flying status. Uh, because of the ramifications uh, with them, I'm probably still going to provide them a hotel as long as I possibly can. Chronologically, what's going on? Uh, last month, we officially kicked off actions necessary for the divestment of the ASOG. 
and the Ace of Austin Bridge. Place that with a CRG. A lot of moving parts there. A lot of people are interested in moving down there as they're going to kick off the CRG in April. We still don't have the UMD, the Manning document, so we can hire people against it. So we're trying to get ahead of April the best we can, but we're limited on what we can do. Once again, that CRG, that's the organization that is going to go open uh, a base in another country, open it up for a week or two. They're going to hand it over to the unit that's going to come in and replace them. And then whenever they close down the base, the CRG will go in there and take it away from the for whoever's running the air base. I learned about this in Germany last year on Air Defender. I was a senior airport authority. When I showed up at Woonstorf Air Base, I took the base uh, away from the continued response, I ran the base for a few weeks, and then I handed it back to the continued response, which handed it over to the host nation. So that's what we're doing. We're one of, gonna be one of three CRGs, contingency response groups with, throughout the entire National Guard. This month, you're going to see announcements for first sergeants. There are four positions going open, and that's going to be for the AMXS, CE, Medical Group, and Air Left Wing. So get your application in there if you are interested in being a first sergeant. Also, we have applications for Outstanding Airmen of the Year. Deadlines in the month of November, I want you to be aware of. And that's to get your 1206 form done so we can nominate the good people. Get that taken care of. In December, we're going to have the Wing Commander's Call. I've kind of limited those a little bit. Last one I did over teams. I'm going to start doing podcasts. But in December, we'll do that in person with the entire wing. We'll do our family Christmas party. Uh, also in December, there's going to be a wing Christmas party that's off base, and that's 20 December. If you're interested, buy tickets, whether you're full-time, part-time. We'd love to have you to celebrate uh, the holidays. As we look into February, drill, big things I'm tracking right now is a strategic leadership offsite. So last year was the first time that I took uh, 86 leaders throughout the base. Commanders, SELs, first sergeants, subject matter experts, wing staff. And we just talked for a couple of days and connected about everything that's happening in the base. And we started looking at our five-year plan and strategic plan uh, to get us what's going to happen over the next few years. As we stand up an A staff, as we go through two different conversions, um, just get us on the same page. So the plan is to bring them to McDill down in Florida for a few days over February. We're going to do that then. And then other things we're talking about is PHA quick, as mentioned previously, that has to be in March when the wing pretty much stands down for medical readiness. In May, we have the retirement dinner, a great event for everybody to come to. We're going to have new NCO induction ceremonies across the wing. And we're looking to stand that up for those newly promoted staff sergeants who made the transition to that next tier. In closing, make it count every time you put on this uniform, right? You're a part of a special organization. It's a well-established culture over 77 years. Good people came before you. Find a way to pass that on. Nurture it. It's a good thing here. I've worked a lot of civilian jobs and military jobs, and I've not found anything like the Peoria Air National Guard. It's a great place to be. I love it here. Another note, when you wear that uniform, know that there's a lot of uncertainty in the world. You have the election, you have an inauguration coming on, you have the war in Ukraine with Russia, you have North Koreans helping them, China helping them, you have everything that's happening in Iran and Israel. A lot is in the face of our country right now. But one thing that gives them faith in the future is a good, solid military. All right? So when somebody thanks you for your service, look at them and say, hey, thank you for your support. Stand high. Put your shoulders back and be proud of what you do. You do good things. You're needed. You're valued. You want it. I look forward to working with this drill weekend. Have a good day. Let us know what you want to hear. If you're not getting what you need, let us know. Do you want to know about the meals and the dining facility? Do you want to know what's going on during the weekend? We're looking for that feedback. We want to make it something that you would enjoy. 